The Cogito Alpha Fund has delivered an annualized return of 16.43% over the last two years versus 14.91% for its benchmark, the SWIX All Share Index. In January alone, the fund returned 8.47% on the back of strong performances from the likes of Sapaku, Advitech, and Investec. So will it continue? Fund manager Anthony Durham joins us in studio to discuss, and you certainly hope it's going to continue, don't you? Absolutely. We've got some exciting stocks in the portfolio. And um, yeah, we think that as the economy improves, um, we'll get strong pricing power and volume growth, and that will translate into, through an operating leverage effect into strong earnings growth and performance. Anthony, just to talk about that performance, I mean, 8.43%, uh, I'm just intrigued to find out, is that the biggest one month return that the fund has delivered, or have there been bigger ones than that? Because that's a big number. Yeah, it's a big number. It's the second biggest. We've, I think we've done slightly more than that in uh, you know, two years ago, in December two years ago. You, you mentioned just uh, broadly, we wanted to, before we jump into the, the, the stock picks and, and your portfolio holdings, um, we wanted to just ask you, you alluded to an improving economy uh, in your opening remarks there. I just wanted to find out what you're sort of seeing at the macro level. Well, it's our thesis that um, the US has t t took us into this financial crisis and will be the US that pulls us out. You know, you're starting to see a pickup in housing there. You're starting to see a big kind of dividend from much lower energy costs. You're starting to see the effects of very low interest rates and lots of liquidity washing around in asset prices. That improves consumer confidence. So we think that growth in the US will pick up certainly in the second six months of this year and that will kind of buoy equity markets around the world, including ours. I want to pick up on, on those three stocks that have led your performance uh, higher. Investec, where do we stand with Investec at the moment? Because there's been a lot of debate uh, about the stock and where, where we're going to see this one trading down the line. I think Investec's been a ben beneficiary of the risk on trade in the last five months. So, you know, it's, it's part of a, a group of shares in European banks that have done well. I think longer term, this is a company that's very geared towards a pickup in capital market activities, pickup in property prices, um, you know, writing back of provisions that they've made against, you know, possibly doubtful loans they've made in the property portfolio. I think it's got a fantastic asset management business that's a beneficiary of all this global liquidity. It's got a, f a global franchise, global brand, um, it's got, you know, a suite of products that on average perform quite well. Um, I think it's a good franchise, you know, compared to the rest of the local banks, it trades on roughly half its price to book or half the price to book of, you know, for example, First Rand. Um, so I think there's great value there. It's done quite well in the last four months, but I think there's probably maybe 20% upside in terms of the valuation from this level. But, you know, I would expect to pull back. You know, it's run, you know, exceptionally hard. Uh, Anthony, it's, it's, it's also a great share that uh, for a long while in the, in the early part of uh, last decade earned a lot of its profits from private banking. and. Uh, while they called it private banking, there was a lot of sort of uh, private client merchant banking, investment banking, and, and specialized property funding that was taking place there. Uh, any sign of those uh, improving uh, in, in the three geographies they operated? Yeah, I think the credit extension numbers were up today, and Investec certainly had the highest amount of credit extended over the period reported. And that's quite encouraging. You're starting to see, certainly around the Santon CBD, you're starting to see building activity pick up. You're starting to see, you know, the the green shoots of, of more kind of activity in the kind I of I haven't heard economy. that term green shoots for, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll start speaking a lot of, of green shoots going forward, given the, the traction that you say we're seeing in the US housing market. Absolutely. And I think if you're looking for a pickup in uh, you know, property valuations in the UK and Ireland, possibly Australia, you, know, you could play very few counters in our market. But Investec, if you go on to think about, think about it, is a geared play on improving you know, general property market around the world. You, you talk about the, uh, you know, the, the, the asset management business, which is phenomenal. It's a, it's a proper uh, globally entrenched business. They've now got distribution centers in Hong Kong and, and South America and all over the place. But the capital markets bit, uh, division has been uh, struggling a little bit. We hear about the, the sort of, uh, I guess, right sizing of the capital markets, sell side uh, research and uh, trading uh, abilities. They've made some mistakes in the past. Do you think they can get this right in the UK, which is uh, you know, a very hard market, not only from the macro perspective, but also from a competitive landscape uh, point of view, to compete in? Yeah, if it was up to me, I would you know, close down the capital markets business or, or, or you know, make it 
you know, seriously smaller. I mean, I think the, the key business is, is around asset management and, and their private bank. But I think, you know, Vestic share prices underperformed for about eight years now, it's gone nowhere. Um, one of the reasons that it hasn't performed well is that it was undercapitalized relative, you know, to Basel III requirements. Now those have kind of been paired back and extended. So it's less capital constrained um, than it was. And I think that's possibly also a reason why the c company's re-rated in the last three or four months. You also highlighted uh, Sapaku as one of the, the stocks uh, with regard to your, your good performance. This is a, a company in the industrial space. Often when we look at PPC, it's a, we've always come to that uh, argument that Sapaku is a competitor, is going to shake up the cement industry. Is that, is that what is happening here? Absolutely. This is you know, a hugely exciting event. For the first time in about 35 years, we're getting new cement capacity being developed in South Africa. They're going into production November this year. Um, they should produce at full steady state about two and a half million tons a year and a total market of about 16 and a half million tons. Um, the thesis is that their plants are much newer, therefore much you know, less costly to run, much more efficient in terms of energy. They've got quite a clever way of, of doing their logistics between Delmas and Lichtenberg where the plant is. Um, and I think that as building act activity picks up, we'll go from an oversupplied market to an undersupplied market in the next two or three years. And I think the and market is going to be well positioned to take very, advantage. Very well positioned indeed. So we th we're very excited about the, the medium to longer term prospects of Sapaka. We think there's much more upside in the share price. With this capex, have they talked a, a, much about uh, potentially exporting into Africa? Because we've seen some consolidation taking place in Nigeria. Uh, with uh, just escapes me now. There's cement producer there. Dangote <laughs> I mean, cement. Dangote cement. Sorry, uh, is there an opportunity? Are they kind of talking about opportunities no, you, to you export? You or is can't it rail. Very much South African stuff. You know, cement is very heavy. It's very costly to to move around. So you want to be, produce it where it's really used. Um, their focus is going to be primarily on the uh, Gauteng market. They are developing a, another facility up in Limpopo, um, and they'll possibly be able to e export into the sub region. But really, to to export cement from the reef, Gauteng, up into West Africa is just not a viable proposition. Anglo-American today announcing that they're upping their, their dividend by fifteen percent. Cynthia Carroll wanting to leave on a high note. Yeah, and I think that Anglo is, is you know, there's a litany of woe around the Anglo share price. There's lots of kind of intrinsic value. Um, one would think that as they start to deal with the problem children in the portfolio, you'll start to see a re-rating the share have price. Have you been holding the stock for a long time? We have. I'm starting to get a little bit tired of holding it, so we're <laughs> paring down the, the position. I noticed that frown when, yeah. I, when I went to Anglo-American. Yeah. I'm sorry to yeah. ruin your day. I thought you'd be happy about the dividend. No, the we're dividend happy with the thing. dividend. We'd be much more happy if we had some kind of clarity on, you know, around the issues around Minas Rios, um, about Amplats. There's lots of issues, lots of kind of noise around Anglo. So. Do you think Marco Giovanni is going to come up with some silver bullets for Anglo-American shareholders silver in bullets, particular? Uh, for maybe for Cynthia Carroll, perhaps. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, a very annoyed yeah. shareholder we have on the desk. Maybe we should move on from Anglo-American quickly. Yeah. Warren, throw it forward to another stock. I think I think we just uh, yeah we should just throw it forward. Uh, Anthony, we, we attended the results presentation for Pan uh, African. Mm -hmm. but I th I'm just checking your your uh, your list of shares that you own here in terms of resources. Pan African. We've got Anglo American, uh, and we've got another little gold company called Village Main Reef. Mm. And we've got so Exara as well. And Exara. So, just so Pan African. Talk about the gold ones. Yeah, Pan African is a stock that we've done very well out of over the last three or four years. We think we started buying it at about 67, 70 cents. And now 2 and 50. 2 and 50. So here's a company that's kind of issued 25% more shares, is doubling its gold production with the purchase of Evander. It's going to double its platinum group metals production Phoenix to 50,000 ounces. They should be able to generate 250,000 ounces producing gold at 230,000 rand a kilogram, selling at about 450,000. The margins are very wide. Um, it's cheap, one of the cheapest gold mines in the world, They're trading on just over 10 times earnings. I think it'll do 25 cents for the full year in earnings. Um, it really, you know, if you've got a view that the rand should weaken and gold price should stay firm to go higher, I think this is the best way to play a higher rand gold price. Anthony, the, the acquisition, the Ivana acquisition is a big one and I, I see it's just gone through so that they formally own the uh, Ivana gold mine now, but does it make you worried when you see CEOs making a fairly big acquisition by their standards? 
uh, with this purchase of Vivanda? Sure, it's, it's, it's a game-changing acquisition for them. Um, it increases the operational risk, but de-risks the overall operation. Now they've got two mines, um, two resources. Um, so I think overall, net net, same amount of risk, but much more upside. We seldom get the opportunity to focus on the, the fat tail in the market, and I see a number of, of stocks here that fall into that space, something like Rolf's. I know you've spoken to me about it. Uh, it's in the industrial space, is that correct? Absolutely. This is a very exciting little company. Um, 40 see, I'm, I'm hoping to unlock the 10 baggers of the future. That's why we've <laughs> got to delve into these stocks. This is a company that will be bought at 80 cents and it's trading at about five rand now. Well, first started buying at 80 cents, so it's almost a 10 bagger for us. Um, we'll be at around about 10 bucks a share, I guess. So. And you, you sound as though you're confident it's going there. Yeah, I think it's 40% owned by a guy called Arnold Furry, who owns Pinnacle Technologies. He's mastered the art of buying well and integrating acquisitions. Um, I think they're going to try and do exactly the same thing with Rolfs. It's buying out chemical distribution businesses, specifically now in mining and water, chemi water treatment chemicals. They're building a distribution hub into Africa. So this is a very exciting business that can scale up very rapidly with some clever acquisitions. They bought a company called AgChem on three times earnings. They've integrated it well. It's producing about 30% of operating profit at the moment. It's just a very, very good story indeed. It's not cheap, but it, I think relative to the growth prospects, it's, it looks very exciting. Just to clarify, it's called Rolf's Technology Holdings, but it's mm. got nothing to do with technology, does it? No. What, what does this company do? It does pigments manufacture. Uh, chemical distribution, and specifically the ag chem does agricultural chemicals, which is pesticides, herbicides, um, and that kind of stuff. So yeah. growth stimulants. So it's you know it's got a great kind of Af African growth. If you like agriculture in Africa, if you like mining in Africa, this is a great way to play. Did you play Pinnacle correctly? Yeah, we own it. We sold it too soon, unfortunately. Um, but you know we thought what we did is we had exposure to Rolfs and we upped our exposure to Rolfs. So we're getting the same kind of management, same philosophy, same you know, intrinsic ability to buy and integrate well in a distribution business that's kind of almost infinitely scalable. 